What do you think is the most persuasive pro-life argument? What do we do with people are like, what's in the womb is a human and they are alive, but it doesn't matter because the rights of the mother are more important than this nascent human life, one that people get frequently, the cases of rape or incest. What's the pro-life response to that? If you're working your normal job, how do you even have conversations about abortion when it's so controversial? The starting point is that we need to speak out because there is a victim group that is entirely in capable of speaking out for itself. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. So much of the pro-life message today is about service and love. That is the whole core of the message. And so much of the pro-abortion message is about what can I do for myself or how can I protect myself against this new and encroaching life. I have today, we have today on the podcast, a really special person, somebody that I love dearly, is a close friend, but who also has traveled the world speaking internationally in life, is an author, has started organizations. Her name is Stephanie Gray Connor, and she just wrote a book called My Body For You. She talks very personally about the experience of motherhood and how it's transformed her in giving up of herself for another, for her child. And she also talks about the importance in our movement of understanding what's that really the core of the human experience, that we are designed to give of each other for each other and how we can also winsomely communicate this to other people in our culture who maybe don't understand that. They maybe support abortion or they have this view of life that it's not so much about what we're giving, but about how we're protecting ourselves. And she unpacks all of that. In this conversation, we're going to talk about her book, her story. We're also going to talk about some tough objections. If you are pro-choice or in support of abortion, tough objections that an abortion supporter would have for a pro-lifer and how to answer them persuasively as a pro-life advocate. So this is a jam-packed episode, a lot of great stuff, and it's just a great conversation I'm getting to have with somebody that I love very much. So I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. And without further ado, let's welcome Stephanie to the show. Thanks so much for coming on, Stephanie. Thank you, my sis. I just wish we were in person. I know. It's been way too long. So a quick backstory here. I, Stephanie, how long have we known each other? I love how you always you are, have to <laughs> check with me. I'm your memory. <laughs> you're you're the best memory. How long has it been? 2007. So 2017, 18, 19, 20. 17 <laughs> years? Is that 17 years? I think Almost that sounds years. right. Yeah. And we are both pregnant right now. Yes. And only a week, a week apart. apart. And a week apart. And then I just have to brag for a moment about you because you are someone that has inspired me from the beginning of my pro-life activism. I met you, I think, was I 18, 19 years old and mm -hmm. learning pro-life national activism. You were already on the scene. You started an organization in Canada, but now you're a United States person, not citizen. Are you a citizen yet? I am. I am, a proud, I'm a proud green card holder and just okay. waiting the time required to become a citizen. <laughs> but I am, I'm going to take full responsibility for your pathway to citizenship because, and you can just, now you get to brag on me and what I, I what my, my claim to fame for you. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> you have made my life just so much better because you set me up with my beloved husband, who is a living saint and my best friend and uh, the joy of my life. And I also credit you with saving the life uh, indirectly of my daughter, Violet. And which is why Violet's middle name is Grace for Lila Grace, because um, we lost our first baby. And when we were pregnant with her, uh, I had my progesterone tested and found it was dropping and was worried we'd have another miscarriage. And I remember texting you and being like, mm -hmm. do you know one of those pro-life doctors that, that prescribes progesterone? And you got me in touch with Dr. George Delgado that hour. Mm -hmm. And then he prescribed me progesterone that night. And then I found a local doctor three days later to carry it on. So, mm -hmm. um, but yeah, God. people people need to know that in 2016, you tried to set me up with my husband and I was the defiant personality that shot you down and said, no, I'm not going <laughs> to. I'm not interested. It's long distance. <laughs> I don't want an American. <laughs> But in 2020, God orchestrated amazing, miraculous things. And I, I credit you for connecting me to my beloved Joe. So there is an episode, by the way, for those listening, this is not on YouTube. So it's an episode you can only access on the podcast app, Apple or Spotify or whatever. But it's about Stephanie's love story. It's really beautiful and inspiring and encouraging. 
check it out. And then there are also some great relationship advice there too from Stephanie and her many years of prayer formation and study on it. So anyways, I'm, I'm your biggest fan. I think you're the best Steph and I am so happy. And now you have your beautiful Violet and now this new baby yes. who, are, who I think is nicknamed Geo, right? Yes. So after Violet, we lost three more babies mm-hmm. and then we got pregnant with this one we've named Geo. And the first priest to pray over us uh, was uh, my parents' pastor back in Canada where we were visiting, and his name is Father Giovanni. And so, of course, we wanted this baby to stick so badly, and so we're like, Father, pray over us. And we're like, we will nickname this baby Gio for the duration of the pregnancy um, uh, because of him, as well as, even though we don't know the sex yet, uh, it's just the nickname until birth, Um, but also because Gio in Italian is for John. And mm. Elizabeth and Zachariah received John the Baptist in their life, in their old age. And I am 43 and Joe is 48. So <laughs> spring chicken boy or stuff. Girl, now it's Gio. <laughs> There's a few more after this one. You know, you know, Rachel Campbell Stuffy, I think we've talked about her before, but she's a Catholic mom of, I think, nine kids now. She had her last. I always talk about her because she's beautiful and successful and had this beautiful marriage. And she has nine kids and she had her last at 48. So <laughs> You've got a few more to go. <laughs> I know everyone keeps talking about these friends of theirs. I know someone who was 48. I know someone who was 52. Someone just oh, told wow. me. wow. Yeah. So, All right. Uh, yeah. My husband <laughs> and I joke if we had listened to you in 2016 and gotten married then. Oh, I thought <laughs> we'd well, have even more kids. <laughs> yes. But God's plan is perfect and his timing is perfect and it's working out so beautifully. A big thank you to our sponsor, a new sponsor, the Amen app. The Amen app is a free prayer app that is a project of the Augustine Institute. And I think you're really gonna love it because it's free. You can download it from the app store and it will help you pray through your day. I actually have been listening to the Amen app for over a year now. I listen to it almost every day to hear the readings of the day so I can hear from the Old or the New Testament. I can hear from a Psalm and then I get to hear from the gospels and often the words of Christ. And then they have this great meditation session for a couple minutes that leads you through reflecting on the Holy Scripture that you just heard. They also have on the Amen app free reflections and meditations. They have sleep stories and they have some kids content. There's a lot of great stuff on there and it's free. So what are you waiting for? Download the Amen app. You can never have too many prayer apps. So if you have other prayer apps on your phone, great. That's great too. But check out Amen as well. It's really easy to use. It's free and it'll help you deepen your faith with God. I mean, that's really the beauty of it. So check out the Amen app today. There's a link in the bio for you to download the Amen app for free today. Well, listen, you're very busy. You've got your beautiful Violet. You're now pregnant, all of the things, and you just wrote a book. So Love Unleashes Life is one of your books, which is a pro-life apologetics book in many ways. This one is two to some degree, but just share quickly for folks why you wrote this new book. It's very beautiful and the heart behind it. Thank you. Well, yes, and you so kindly endorsed it. Um, So yeah, I wrote Mm -hmm. My Body for You, a pro-life message for a post-Roe world. And this came Mm -hmm. on the heels, of course, of the Supreme Court's Dobbs decision overturning Roe v. Wade just about a year and a half ago. Um, And I have been speaking and writing on abortion for multiple decades and felt and have always been convicted that I didn't want to write something new unless it actually was new or I was contributing something more. And I have felt in the last few years, having spent 20 years as a professional speaker and debater, but in the last few years now having experienced um, getting married and becoming a mother and both life as well as loss through pregnancies that succeed to birth as well as miscarriages, that there were experiences and insights I've now had as a mother that will complement my years of apologetics debate experience. And so I wanted to put something down on paper to help carry the movement forward in this post-Roe, post-Dobbs world that really blends the intellectual, rigorous, academic experience I've had with the more emotional heart experience of becoming a mother and experiencing pregnancy and motherhood, which is really at the heart of of this whole debate. And so I bring those two worlds together. And really, the title, in a sense, says it all, My Body for You. I wanted to make it Eucharistic. I wanted to make it Um, the heart of the gospel message, which is Jesus laying down his life for us and then reflecting on how motherhood is an example of taking up a cross and following Christ and laying down our bodies for our children. I think that's such a profound starting place for your whole, kind of, it's like a meditation, your book in many ways. It's very beautiful, um, my body for you. But, you know, what is abortion? It's destroying somebody else's body 
for your own sake, you know, because of your fears or your own ambitions or your own concerns? And what is the pro-life answer, the, the, the right, you know, the beautiful act of love is to say, no, my body for you, which is exactly what our faith teaches us, Jesus's body given for us. The beautiful thing, though, about pregnancy is, and, and you know, Jesus's uh, sacrifice for us, though, is you get as mothers, you know, we have been given, I know this experience is true for you, too. We've been given so much. Yes, pregnancy can be very challenging. It can be fraught, delivery. Being a parent has its many challenges, but you get such an incredible gift of that beautiful new life that is so full of just amazing joy and potential. And, you know, I look at my two sons and I know you have this experience with Violet, your daughter, but I'm just like, you are just amazing. You're de- you do delight me at the deepest core of my soul more than I knew was possible. And my husband feels the same way. That experience is a gift for parents uniquely. And it's, it's worth every sacrifice. Yes, absolutely. And it's this beautiful give and take. So Uh, we are so blessed by our children. And I can agree with what you say about just kind of being in awe of your children. Joe and I will constantly, and of course, it's hilarious. We both have Joes as husbands. (laughs) Joe and I constantly- The best name for a husband is Joe. (laughs) Mary did it first, Joseph, and we've got our Joes. Highly recommend. (laughs) Exactly. So my Joe and I will just, like Violet will say something or do something like um, the other day, she was just repeatedly saying what sounded like um, body, body, body. So then I responded by saying, you have a body. And then I said, you are a body and a soul. And the moment I said that, I am not exaggerating. She's two years old. Violet responded, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. <laughs> and how old is Violet? Two. That is awesome. That is awesome. <laughs> that is because... Uh, Wait, do you guys different... pray the Magnificat? Do you guys yes. pray Mary's prayer, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord? Yeah, and there's so she. Beautiful. It's in her. It's in her. That's it's so beautiful. Her. It's in her. It's God loves that. And so before bed, that's often there's a beautiful song version of the Magnificat. Mm-hmm. And so Joe and I will sing her that song, and we've been singing mm-hmm. that to her regularly. So it's not that it came out of nowhere, but that her little brain could compute what she hears at night, and it be triggered by that comment, you are a body and a soul, and then she then repeat it back. So Joe and I were just both stunned, and we're like. Oh my gosh. But it's moments like that where we marvel at her growth, her development, her beauty, her the joy that she brings us. Mm-hmm. Um, are there hard times? Yes, I write about that in the book. You know, there have been very hard times when I was in labor with her. I start the book off by saying I should have been a nun, which you will find hilarious because all these years <laughs> people would say, You should be a nun. I'd be like, I want to get married. Uh, but when I was in the throes of labor, I wanted to be a nun because it was so painful. And I thought the path without this pain is the nunnery. Um, you know, <laughs> breastfeeding was difficult, uh, excruciatingly painful. Mm-hmm. She didn't latch for three weeks. And a turning point for me was when she was about six months old. And again, I write about this in the book, but she was six months old. We were at church. Everything at this point, we were in a good groove. Breastfeeding was fine. And Violet started fussing and Joe was holding her. So he passed her to me and I would at that point breastfeed on demand. So I just sat down in the pew and began to breastfeed her at the exact moment it happened to be the consecration. And I'm looking down as she latches to my breast as I'm listening to the priest say, take and eat. This is my body given for you. And I just had this moment of of realization, like I am living the gospel through my motherhood. I'm being blessed by it in, in getting to watch this beautiful, unique, unrepeatable human being grow and develop. Um, but I get to be something for her. I get to be her source of sustenance. Like she is literally consuming my flesh. And, and it's that life of self-sacrifice that motherhood calls us to that is just so profoundly beautiful, even amidst the challenges. So, yeah. That's so beautiful, Stephanie. How has motherhood, uh, we're going to get to some pro-life apologetics here soon, but how has motherhood changed you? <laughs> that is a good question. <laughs> um, in, in every way. <laughs> uh, it, has, it has softened me. It has slowed me down. And, and mm-hmm. you, you know that and how much we both traveled and, and were on the circuit and, and doing things. And of course, to a degree, we're both still involved in the pro-life movement. But 
Mm -hmm. uh, having a more simple life and a simple day, um, just entering into relationship and being with more than doing. And that's one of the things because I was so focused on in, in my ministry work, doing, 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 realizing so much of the time, Violet just enjoys the presence of the other. Yes, she wants me to play mm -hmm. with her. But even if I'm not directly playing with her, if I'm side by side, uh, Joe and I both have the primary love language of touch. So we have created mm -hmm. a child <laughs> whose primary love language is touch. So, you know, she loves being in our arms and being cuddled, being next to us, even if she's looking at her own book and we're not actually reading it <laughs> to her. So slowing down, being present and in the present moment, mm -hmm. um, you know, realizing both the need to be more patient and growing in patience and then realizing how impatient I am and how easily I can can become frustrating. You and I have talked about this. So you don't I know. I was like, I never got impatient before kids. I was the most patient person in the world. And now I'm like, it's a daily struggle. Yeah. It's a daily struggle. Oh yeah. Yeah. Like when things are good, they're they're great. And then when your child won't go down for a nap and they've repeatedly come out of the room and you're and you're trying to teach them, you know, routine, but also obedience. Like if I've told you to do this, it's for your good, you should do it. Like I have such a difficult time reigning in my temper. So um so motherhood continually then helps me grow as a person and helps me grow in virtue in ways um I think not having Violet wouldn't have done. Mm -hmm. One of the things I've found myself struggling with the most is now because I have two and more, our thirds on the way, we have one in heaven, but they're two and four. And when they fight, you know, when there's constant, they're usually best friends and they do love to play together. They really love each other, but they fight a lot. And when they fight, I, I cannot, like uh, the conflict maybe, but I'm just like, no, don't fight, you know? And, and then I start getting, a, and, and the last thing of two fighting little toddlers, you know, little boys need is their mother to lose, lose her mind when they're fighting. Cause that's just going to escalate the situation. But obviously that's, you know, that's the struggles, like being the calm one, the peacemaker, um, when the fighting can be just so frustrating. It's like, stop fighting, you know? Yes. Well, and I've also heard, and maybe you can testify to this, that also when you see your, your children interact as siblings, they will start to say or do things to the sibling that the parent has said or done with them. <laughs> and it's like, oh, shoot, I guess maybe I shouldn't have that tone of voice. You're using it on your siblings. So I'm sure that awaits me. Yeah. Peter, the older one, you're very naughty, Leo. I'm like, uh oh, I shouldn't. It's not good to say that to a kid. You can say that is naughty to do that. But the you're very naughty, you know, assigning that label to him. And I'm like, where did he learn that? He's like, oh, he's <laughs> condemning his poor brother. How you yeah, don't do that, Leo. That's so naughty. Um, like, OK, you, let's you're not the parent. I'll be the parent here. Um, so so Stephanie, when, when you were writing My Body for You, you mentioned being in math and like having that moment of realization that Violet is you're giving Violet your body like we're, like Jesus gave his body for us. What have been some other moments for you that have been just, I guess, transformative in a new way to see your pro-life work is now most fully alive in your motherhood. And that's the beautiful thing. Every, everyone listening, you know, I've talked to a lot of stay at home moms over the years and just moms who've had to kind of pull back career a little bit um, or dads who are, you know, doing their kind of everyday career. It's not like pro-life activism career. It's just actual, you know, working at a bank or, you know, working as a doctor, whatever it is. And, you know, I say what you're doing, what you're living, if it's for your family, for your kids, that's pro-life. You know, that's the heart of being pro-life. Yes. You know, what comes to mind is actually a time I was on um, the Strong Women podcast. It's produced by the Colson Center. I think you've been on them as well. And um, I was asked if I could have dinner with anyone in history, who would I want to have dinner with? And the time I was asked that question, I think Violet was about eight months. And my immediate answer was Jesus's mother, Mary, because I would want to talk to someone who uh, made their child for mission, like who mm. built into them and spent quiet days and months and years for 30 years preparing their child for the epic mission of love that they were uniquely called to. And I find myself now overwhelmed would be maybe too strong a word, but deeply reflecting on how do I raise Violet well? <laughs> How do I spend my days so that she fulfills her unique mission of love for God? 
And when I gave that answer, I then reflected on the fact that had I been asked that question a few years prior, when I was single and doing my full-time pro-life work, I would have said something like, you know, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. or one of the suffragettes, because it, in that season of life, in the activist realm I was in, I would have wanted to talk to another activist, okay? I want to have dinner with you. Tell me everything you did to to change the culture. And of course, there's still that, lots of great questions I think I could ask of such individuals and learn from such individuals. But that realization that I have this incredible gift, responsibility, and opportunity to invest in the future through investing in the soul of another human person and forever impacting the world through how I impact her and and really thinking through what does that look like and what did that look like for Mary as she raised Jesus? Mm -hmm. What were their simple days like and how in a way do I emulate that in the year 2024? Um, yeah, so that just came to mind when, mm -hmm. yeah, when you asked me that. A big thank you to our sponsor, Seven Weeks Coffee. SevenWeeksCoffee.com is a gourmet, delicious roast and ethically sourced coffee company, but it's also a pro-life coffee company. You not only get these best in class, delicious coffee roasts that are delivered right to your door, but you're also supporting the pro-life movement because 10% of all the money, the revenue that Seven Weeks makes goes right back into the pro-life movement to directly support pregnancy resource centers that help moms and babies in need. So 10% is a lot. That's not 10% of their profits. That's 10% of everything. The people over at Seven Weeks are also just wonderful people. They're really motivated in service of others and the cause. And the coffee is delicious. So stop supporting coffee companies, many that support abortion. Start ordering from sevenweeks.com. They have this new club on the website where you can actually become a monthly subscriber and your money monthly will go to the pregnancy resource centers and you'll get to enjoy your delicious cup of coffee. So go to sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's sevenweekscoffee.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. Why do you think so many mothers and would-be mothers, um, you know, mothers who maybe are pregnant or maybe they're considering, you know, the pathhood of mother motherhood in the future, why do you think there's so much fear or negativity around motherhood? It's kind of seen as this place that dreams go to die or boring or just messy and painful. You know, why, why do you think that is? A few thoughts come to mind. I think in some situations, people might not be in an ideal relationship. So they might not have the support that ideally we need to fulfill our motherhood and correspondingly for a uh, a man to be in a good relationship to really adequately fulfill his fatherhood we are meant for relationship we're meant for a communion of persons we're not meant to do parenthood alone so in some situations i think people might not have found that right person or might be struggling in their relationship and it might be hard to envision the the daily self-sacrifice involved with parenthood because it might be made harder than normal. It is hard. It is hard. It's got challenges, but it might be made more difficult if you don't have that, that support network. Um, the other thing that comes to mind is our culture has just become so self-absorbed, immediate gratification, quick fix. I mean, even like just with the internet, not that the internet is bad. It's kind of neutral and it's used for good things. It's used for bad things. I mean, obviously this is a great medium to use, to use the internet for, um, but it has, it has trained us to expect things instantaneously that if you s hit send on an email that you expect someone else is going to reply ASAP, that if you text someone, they're going to respond back right away. And so this mindset of instant gratification doesn't go well with parenthood because there isn't always instant gratification. There are moments of pure delight. When when Violet wakes from her nap, um, I often say it's like the price is right. She comes out of her room like, come on down. And she's so, she gives me a big grin and immediately crawls into my lap and just wants mm -hmm. to cuddle. Like, it's just like this moment of pure joy and delight. But then there are other times that things things are boring, you know, repeatedly playing with Play-Doh or blocks when you're an adult and you have advanced to more elaborate activities. 
it is hard. So there there have been times where I have thought fondly of your and my adventures of, you know, going on speaking trips and doing things together and just not that that was bad. That was good. It was beautiful. And there are times of motherhood where it's not as exciting as that once was. So I think that can be hard for people too, to maybe let go of a life that um, in the moment was had experiences that were maybe more energizing and fun. Um, and again, not that that's necessarily bad. Uh, and again, as I've pointed out with even how Violet wakes up from her nap, like there's beautiful and rewarding moments. But I think some people resist motherhood because of the times where it is challenging and where it's a long-term investment. And people have said to me, the days are long and the years are short. Mm. And I'm starting to see that with Violet already being almost two and a half and this next baby coming and just thinking there were times when I was sleep deprived and just so exhausted thinking, how am I going to do this? And now two and a half years have already flown by. Mm. You know, part of our movement, so much of our movement, I should say, is focused on those women who experience unplanned pregnancy and they are considering abortion, right? I mean, the whole Pregnancy Resource Center movement, which is, uh, I think, well over thousands now. We have multiple thousands of these centers in this country, nonprofits who serve mothers, usually single mothers, who are facing um, unplanned pregnancy, considering abortion. And like you said earlier, you know, a lot of the reason maybe for the angst around motherhood is you're not in the right relationship or the time in your life and you're concerned, you're fearful, you don't feel you have the resources what is the message? What's your message? And what's the message of my body for you for that woman, often a single mother or a woman who is unmarried, who is facing pregnancy, was not planning on it and is tempted to abortion? Yes, that there are other people that are standing in the gap who are saying my body for you. And by that, I mean, what comes to mind is something I write about in the book, which is one of my all-time favorite ministries to pregnant women, which is the Sisters of Life. And uh, I also write in the book how I believe all human beings at our ultimate maturity are called to motherhood or fatherhood. Mm -hmm. Whether that's biological or spiritual, we are all called at the height of our development to maternity or paternity. And the Sisters of Life fulfill that through spiritual maternity. And they invest in women who often have a lot of self-doubt and who haven't been supported and don't have the father of their children in their life or even their extended family around them who feel alone and for whom abortion seems like a good option. And these women have laid down their lives to become religious sisters and to become spiritual mothers. And they're saying, by being a nun in this particular order, I give my body for you, dear woman. You know, I am giving you my body to teach you how to be a mother, to support you, to lift you up, to even open our convent, which they do in, in one of their convents in, in New York. Pregnant women, as well as mothers uh, after they've given birth, can live with them with their children. And so these sisters invest in women to show that they too can be mothers, to empower them, to uplift them, to encourage them. And the fruits of that are just mind blowing. Like I am so inspired every time I get the uh, imprint magazine of the Sisters of Life where they write about the women that they journey with and um, how beautiful it is that these women are grateful for the lives of their children that they've given birth to and rejected abortion for because the sisters loved them. And it's, mm -hmm. it's often not until we are loved that we can love others. We need, and that's why parenthood and family life is a school of love where we, you know, our parents are our, ideally our first teachers of Christ's example of this is my body given for you. And then we learn that and we give it to others. So the sisters of life, um, each in their own unique, beautiful call to religious life, have embraced that message. Then they impart it and show it and shower these women in love who are pregnant and alone. And those women are like, wow, you've given your body, your life for me through serving me. I now think I can do that for my child. And then they give birth to these children and they love these children and they support these children and their lives are made better because they embraced their maternity rather than rejected it. It's such a beautiful example. I love the Sisters of Life too. And I think the kind of part of the core of what you're saying is isolation, you know, being alone, feeling that you have to do it on your own is a killer. I mean, it really is destructive. It's poisonous and 
if that mother, that woman is feeling alone, she's feeling there's not resources to help her or, or, you know, what's worse than being alone is being alone in a crowd of people. So people around you or being in a relationship and he's telling you to have the abortion, you know, he's encouraging it, which is worse than being alone because you're with someone who is making you completely isolated from help by telling you to get, do the very thing that's destructive. And, you know, there's so many women who experience this, but the hope is like what you're saying is there are many resources out there. And the first step is to know you're not alone and there are other people that want to help, but it's a matter of connecting those dots. How can we, as I mean, people listening to, how can we foster in our own personal lives a culture of that connectivity and that invitation? Because there are many people, even people that are in our pews sometimes in our churches, if we're church going, and certainly people in our communities who are not feeling in community, you know, who who do feel isolated and who themselves might be at risk for considering abortion. Mm hmm. Yeah. So, I mean, we need to first be very aware and be then very welcoming and opening uh, open rather to the people around us, you know, forging friendships and relationships and starting to talk to people. Uh, one of the things, the many things I admire about my husband, but um, he was also raised in the pro-life movement, has very devout parents who were involved in a pro-life pregnancy center that they ran in their community. So it was just natural for him long before he met me to support pro-life pregnancy centers and, you know, financially give significantly to ensure locally women are supported through him supporting the center. Um, and so that's one way people can make sure people are helped locally by focusing on their very communities. I mean, there's always a need at a state level and a national level to do things, but there's that that local level where you can know your center and check it out and be like, yeah, you're worth investing in because you're helping all these people. In our own pews, you know, I've, I've just approached my own pastor and been like, I think it would be good to have a mom's group at the church because I know a bunch of moms and I intentionally hang out with them, but I keep noticing moms I don't know and maybe they need community. You know, even a friend of mine who is married and has support just had her second child, but they don't have extended family around and is really struggled with breastfeeding and some postpartum anxiety. And so we were able to have Christmas with them and do these unexpected, you know, interactions and gestures because we saw a need, but we only saw the need because we talked to people and forged friendships with people. And so it's really at that basic level, are we paying attention to who is around us and are we looking out or are we looking down, you know, on our devices? And so again, the device can connect us, uh, but can also disconnect us. So it's about being so intentional about using things as a means to connect to people uh, not allowing the thing to become a person that we think we're connected to. Such a good point. And it is so tempting to walk through the world connected, glued to that device or just glued to your own agenda. You know, like if you're busy, you know, you've got kids, you've got work, this and that. And it's like not making space for that encounter with the person who might need to talk or the person who might need an extra moment of just grace and attention and love. I mean, that in the modern world and the craziness and the busyness of the modern world, it's so hard to slow down sometimes and make space for other people. But that's the only way that relationship can grow is by making that space. Yeah. And the space can be um, really small and short and unexpected, but leave a positive mm -hmm. impact. I'm reminded of a time I was at the grocery store with Violet and I'm always asked, is she your first? And my answer is always... See, you're such uh, a young mom, Steph. <laughs> Yeah, I know. You know, it's all in how I part my hair, Lila, but the grays are actually hidden in there. Hey, there's a, there, there's something you can do for that. No, I'm just kidding. You're, you're, you're beautiful as you are. We, we've talked a lot about yeah, <laughs> getting the exact right hair color. Um, but I remember saying to this woman, um, actually, my first is in heaven and Violet came right after. Mm. And the moment I said that, she said, I've lost a child, too. And then she opened up about losing her son actually as an adult in his late 30s. Um, and you could see that she was deeply saddened as she shared, but there was something in her that wanted to share. And my passing remark 
gave her permission not only to share, but to have a moment of connection with another human being. And so instead of being in the grocery line, just looking at our phones or looking at magazines, there was just this brief encounter. You know, Pope Francis is, um, throughout his pontificate, talked about the need for a culture of encounter. Are we really encountering the human persons that are in our midst, looking into their eyes, engaging them about their day and who they are and where they're from. And sometimes it's very elaborate, but sometimes it can be fleeting and yet still meaningful. And it was clear in that very brief exchange, it was meaningful both for the woman as, as well as for me. Well, the thing that was so uh, beautiful too about what you just shared, Steph, is that you practiced vulnerability with that woman. You didn't have to say, I have one in heaven. You know, like that's a big deal. Like sometimes I'll be honest when people ask me, how many do you have? I'll say two, I've got one on the way. And then I don't say I have one in heaven. Although I do say that occasionally, it just kind of depends, I guess, on on the moment. But the beauty of, of acknowledging the ones you have in heaven, even in the grocery store line, which can be an awkward place to bring up, I have had a miscarriage basically, is that it gives the other person person permission if they have that desire in their heart for connectivity to be vulnerable too. If you hadn't shared that, then there was no permission given for her to be vulnerable about something that was very heavy on her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And vulnerability breeds vulnerability. Pretty much Mm -hmm. anything clones itself. So anger is going to breed more anger. Kindness will breed more kindness. (laughs) Vulnerability will breed more vulnerability. And uh, I've often said that when we do share and we are vulnerable, um, that we should share to the extent it helps the other person, not to the extent it helps ourselves. Now, having said that, in certain settings, we want to share to help ourselves. In a counseling setting, spiritual direction, talking to our spouse or a good friend, we might have something on our heart we need to share for them to give us advice. But I have found that I think through the grace of God, through the grace of working in the pro-life movement for so many years before I ever experienced pregnancy, I had many years to think about Uh, handling miscarriage because of people who would consult me when I had no experience of what miscarriage was like, but because I was a pro-life speaker and people wanted to know what to do, that our own loss of children, while being profoundly brutal and emotional and devastating, um, I had been prepared to really work through it in a way that has made me very comfortable in being vulnerable and very comfortable in being open. And so that when I talk about my children in heaven, Although I have had moments of tears, I can be in the grocery store and not turn into a bubbling mess Mm -hmm. and can speak of my children so that in sharing about them, it's not about me. It's about the person I'm speaking to who then indeed, like the number of people who when I say I have children in heaven have said, oh, me too. And sometimes it's like that woman who has lost the adult child, but other times people have now spoken to their miscarried children in a way they haven't before because someone else was willing to do that first. It's such a good point because, I mean, it's. I think people confuse maybe vulnerability sometimes with sort of emotional mismanagement. I don't know if that's the right term, but it's like, well, I don't want to just share my stuff with whomever. And, and what you're saying is like, you need spaces and relationships where you can just be raw. Like that is so necessary. Someone doesn't have that in their life. It's extremely painful if they maybe consciously experience that pain or it's subconscious, but we all need those spaces. And first and foremost, we should be able to have that with God, just be raw before God and trust that he loves us and he hears us and he's, he's actively working in our lives. Of course he is. Um, but you know, that's different from, okay, I'm just, you know, full of this vulnerability and it's just kind of gushing out of me because I don't have that safe space for it. Right. right? Or I'm in a, such a raw place in my life. I just had a trauma or I just had, you know, some, you know, difficult thing happen or just, I'm having a really rough day. And so you're kind of just like letting that rawness spill out onto (laughs) whoever it might be. And, you know, that's the human condition, partly like sometimes that just happens. So don't be like hard, too hard on oneself. But at the same time, what you're saying is the, the perfect, you know, the, the goal here is to have the space for the rawness, to be raw, but then to practice sharing in a way that, yes, you're controlling the sharing in order to invite other people to share too. And I think that those things together, if people can practice both of them in the right context, you know, make, just makes for so much beautiful connectivity that's yeah. needed. Right. Which again, we're made for. We're made for a communion of persons and that's a giving and a receiving. Um, I remember hearing uh, a great speaker at an event I spoke at, and 
this uh, presenter was, um, he teaches one of the most popular courses at Harvard on, on happiness and, and human fulfillment. And one of the things he said was his favorite name is, and his original um, language was Hebrew. He said his favorite name uh, is Natan. Uh, which is a palindrome. It's spelled the same forward and backwards, N-A-T-A-N, either way. And he goes, it means uh, essentially to give is to receive. And he loves that the name kind of reflects that, you know, mm -hmm. it goes in one direction, but it goes back the other way. And this idea that when we give, we receive, and that a communion of persons is about this giving and receiving. It's the overflow of the Holy Spirit, the love of the Father and the Son pouring out on each other and, and manifesting in the Holy Spirit, which pours out even more. And we are meant to model that in human relationships. And the spousal relationship is a powerful way to do that. The parenthood relationship is a powerful way to do that. But all human relationships are meant to be a communion of persons of giving and receiving. Did you know that some diaper and wipes companies support abortion? In fact, most of them do, like Huggies and Pampers. It's pretty crazy. That's why I love everylife.com. You've heard me talk about them on the podcast, but this is a best-in-class diapers and wipes company with high-quality products for your baby that is also a pro-life diaper company. They just had this great billboard up in Times Square that said, make more babies. They had this whole campaign celebrating babies, saying we can't have too many babies. They're gifts. And they also put their money where their mouth is, and donate some of their proceeds back to the pro-life movement, including your own live action. So go to everylife.com today. You can get a subscription for diapers and wipes for your little one, and you can know that you're supporting the pro-life movement. That's everylife.com, and you can use the code Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. That's Lila at checkout for 10% off your order. So alongside the you know these kind of deeper... I would call them really spiritual messages of how to invite people in, having that, uh, practicing that spirit of encounter with other people to be welcoming and, um, you know, vulnerable and sharing. Uh, I want to talk, shift a little bit and talk about, you know, those conversations that are difficult that we may have or we may need to have with people that we know about abortion. Um, about the protection of life. I think, you know, the culture, as you know, we talk about this a lot, is very broken. Uh, politically speaking, after Roe v. Wade fell, a lot of states enacted trigger laws which banned abortion, thanks be to God. But then you have these state referendum, these battles, where they're actually voting to enshrine abortion in their constitution. That happened in California. It's happened in Kansas and Ohio and other states. It's just devastating. So, in the whole world of kind of public discourse on abortion, there's so much confusion and I think a lot of fear people even have for how do I engage and be bold. I want to start with even just a willingness to engage and be bold on abortion. And I'd like to hear you share why that's important. You've written books about it. My Body for You is yet another book encouraging engagement on this. Um, and then I want to go to some of the tough uh, questions that people get or answers that people get from people who are in support of abortion and how to respond. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think that the starting point point is that we need to speak out because there is a victim group that is entirely incapable of speaking out for itself. You know, when, when civil rights activists would march in the streets with signs that said, I am a man, they were the victims. And although there were white people who would partner with them, uh, the victims were able to speak up for themselves. But preborn children cannot march in the streets and say, I am a person. Uh, they are entirely incapable of that. And the ones that are mature enough when the abortion is happening to scream, insofar as their mouth opening in a scream form, that scream is never heard. That's why Dr. Bernard Nathanson's The Silent Scream film is such a, a brutal and powerful title because the Th these children cannot even be heard audibly, even if their body physiologically would make a gesture of a noise. No noise comes out. So quite simply, we simply need to speak out because these children have no one, or are, are incapable rather, of speaking out for themselves. And lives are on the line. If we were incapable of speaking out for ourselves and our lives were on the line, would we want someone to do it for us? Yes, then it's the golden rule to unto others as you would, you know, have done unto you. And so absolutely, we can look at the, the post Dobbs, post Roe world and say some states have done wonderful things in protecting preborn children. But without a doubt, there's other states, as you've mentioned, like Ohio, that um, are, are broadening access and support for the killing of, of the youngest of our kind. And so we need to speak out in their defense because they can't speak for themselves. 
Okay, so people listening, I'm going to start to this, go to this next. I mean, if you're working your normal job, you know, you're not in like ministry per se or pro-life activism, you know, you're working in kind of corporate America or you're working in retail or whatever it is, starting there, how do you even have conversations about abortion when it's so controversial? You know, I think by being Socratic, Socrates in his quest for truth was always asking questions. And so the more we are compassionately curious about other people, their views, their passions, how do they get to that view? We can have these conversations with them actually initially even doing more of the speaking than we do, but we've initiated it through our questions. So if, if, you know, it's, someone at work makes a reference to a news story. Like I, I know you covered, you you did a whole podcast on the, the horrible story of Kate Cox, the woman in Texas who um, wanted to abort her baby because her baby had trisomy 18. And as we understand, went out of state to do that. Um, you know, that examples like that that are in the news are going to prompt conversations potentially at the workplace over the lunch table in passing conversation if there's a newspaper in front of someone and their colleague and they happen to see a headline. And so to say, oh, what do you think about that? And then when the person tells you what they think, you know, had, have you always held that view or is that uh, something you've only recently adopted? Oh, it's, oh, it's a new view. When did you adopt that view? Um, what influenced you to come to that conclusion? And it's those open-ended questions that are going to cause people to share, perhaps even quite personally, where they might say they've had an abortion or they drove a friend to a clinic. And then we can ask them, well, how is your friend doing? Or does your friend ever talk about the abortion? Um, you know, what has your experience been? What is someone like you who's had an abortion want someone who's not had an abortion to know? And again, these open-ended questions are going to cause more and more revelation. And so you can start to eventually, through the back and forth, because they're going to ask questions back, impart pro-life apologetics in different perspectives that are affirming to life. But you do it in a way that is respectful and reasonable and a natural progression for what is being shared by the other party. What do you think is the most persuasive pro-life argument? I mean, I think at the end of the day that pre-born children are our equals, that they are living human persons with a right to life that all of us have by virtue of our membership in the human family, not based on a function, not based on popularity, not based on some political decree, but that we have a right to life by virtue of being members of the human family. And because science has established preborn children to be members of the human family, having a human mother and father, uh, because they reproduce sexually to begin their lives at fertilization, because that's how beings which reproduce sexually begin their lives, that they therefore have the same right to life that all of us have. And that if we believe in human equality, and if we reject age discrimination, then we ought to protect uh, the youngest of our kind who are humans like us. I think I think that's the kind of the, the strongest point we can make. Does abortion hurt women? Yes. Physically and emotionally? Yes. I think those are uh, supplemental arguments that can be made. Um, do some abortions cause uh, an experience of pain in some preborn children? Yes, uh, but not all. And so, again, that's a supplemental argument, I think, that can be made. But the the human life of the preborn child and the human right to life uh, that all of us have, I think, is what we need to primarily impart while realizing there's other things that we can draw on. What do we do with, I think this is increasingly common, you and I have talked about this, and your book, your new book, My Body for You, I think gets into this too, but this cultural, I don't know, postmodern phenomenon, we'll call it that, where people are like, yeah, it's a human, yeah, it's human. Okay. You know, kind of potential, but it's human. Yeah, it's a human. I give you that. What's in the womb is a human and they're alive, but it doesn't matter because the rights of the mother to not be pregnant, to not be burdened, to make her own choices are more important than this human, this nascent human life. Yeah. So when people say that, there's two kinds of people who say it, those who believe it and those who don't. So those who who don't believe that the moment you you make some analogy to um, a born individual uh, being killed who's maybe two years old and and saying, well, imagine someone said, oh, I can kill a two year old because my right 
to not want to parent that two-year-old supersedes the two-year-old's right to life. They're going to respond and say, no, but wait a minute. It doesn't matter. The two-year-old's a human being, so you don't have a right to end the two-year-old's life. Then we simply respond back, well, the pre-born child is a human being, so we don't have a right to end their life. And they'll say, no, it's not a human. So then we catch them. They don't but really they might believe. say, But they might say, well, you can drop the two-year-old off at the state you know, Department for Child Services for foster care and, you know, abandon your re- parental responsibilities. Now, there might be criminal neglect involved in that, but you can you can do that without killing the child. When you're pregnant, there's only one way out. And if you expel that baby too early, that's going to kill that baby. The point is, you know, there's something so special. It's almost like pathological about pregnancy is so bad. It's like it's pathology. And so we shouldn't burden them with pregnancy. And I think that's what I hear them go back to like, well, yeah, but the woman is pregnant. Why are you forcing her to stay pregnant? Yeah. So a couple things when, when they would make the example that we could just drop a born child off in the arms or the safety of someone else and therefore walk away, I would ask them, what if there was a set of circumstances such that we couldn't drop the child off right away and be guaranteed their safety? There was no fire station. There was no other person around for five days. Could we justify starving the child for five days until help would come? Or would we have a duty and a responsibility to meet the needs of the toddler for five days until alternative help could take over? And if they would say, well, we have a responsibility for the short-term window until alternative help could come, then we would say, well, then the same is true for pregnancy in the pre-born. Pregnancy doesn't last forever. It's a window of time longer than five days. Uh, But nonetheless, we could find circumstances where born people need to be cared for, you know, for longer than five days before other help can come. And the point is that in the case of pregnancy, that we have a responsibility until alternative help can can step in. And I think the other point we can make is that when they focus on the fact that pregnancy is different because only the woman could keep that child alive, whereas a million other people could care for a two-year-old. And so uh, that's why you can't kill the two-year-old. I would... I would ask such an individual to think through what they've just said. Mm. When only one person is capable of helping another, does that lessen that person's responsibility or does it actually heighten it? So, you know, if you are part of a crowd of 10 paramedics and someone is drowning in a pool and you don't jump in to help the drowning person, because there's nine other paramedics, you're one of the 10, there's nine other paramedics that are responding. And in fact, you realize if you did jump in, it would probably complicate the situation Mm -hmm. that um, there's many other people that can help. You realize the more people that are available to help, it actually lessens your individual responsibility. But that if you were the only paramedic present who knew how to respond to a drowning situation and no one else was around except the person drowning, and you noticed them drowning, that your responsibility to jump in the water and save their life would actually be heightened by virtue of the fact you're the only one who can help. So therefore, when a woman is pregnant and the only one whose body is capable of keeping the preborn child alive, uh, she's actually got a, a heightened responsibility to meet that child's needs, not a lessened responsibility. Well, then people might respond to that and say, okay, well, does the paramedic, let's say you have special skills as a paramedic, someone's drowning, but let's say that this is very fraught situation. You're, you know, jumping into the deep sea ocean. It's a storm. There's a storm happening. You're risking your life to save another person. Are you morally required to risk your life to save another person? And and in this scenario, of course, I'm speaking to a high risk pregnancy, and this is used by, you know, pro-abortion advocates to Uh, justify legal abortion saying, listen, sometimes a woman's life is at risk. It's a high risk pregnancy. So why should she have to choose the child's life over her own life? So a couple thoughts in response. The first is if we look at the analogy to, yeah, the, the paramedic now in a different, more intense and threatening situation, you know, um, what we want to ask is, well, who is the party at risk and who is the party who could help them and what is their relationship and therefore that's relevant because when a woman is pregnant we want to know who is she and when the child is also in jeopardy who is that child and these are not strangers this is a mother and a child what responsibility do parents have for their offspring 
that we don't necessarily have to strangers. So we need to live the golden rule for all people. We have to love our neighbors as we love ourselves, the scriptures teach us. But there is a special responsibility that parents have for their children. And so therefore we have to look at any even, um, uh, you know, any pregnancy, but particularly even these, these life in danger scenarios as not forgetting about what relationship is involved here. It's a parent child relationship. So therefore whatever we do needs to bear in mind that we have to value both lives as unique, unrepeatable, irreplaceable individuals, as well as value the nature of that very sacred bond, which is a unique connection between two people where one has total vulnerability and the other one has total responsibility by virtue of parenthood. Um, one of the things I write about in my book is that there are ethical ways of intervening when a woman's life is in danger. And, and one of the frustrating things post row post Dobbs has been some media outlets misrepresenting stories where women have been in complicated health circumstances and claiming they need an abortion and couldn't get an abortion. Well, um, we don't ever need an abortion because abortion is ending the life of our children. So that's never ethical, but we might need medical intervention. And there are ethical ways of intervening when a woman's life is in danger that don't have to involve abortion. Um, I do think when these stories make the news, and this is one of the points I write about in my book, there is a more fundamental point that we need to get across. And that is our ultimate goal is not length of life. Our ultimate goal is heaven. If someone were to ask me if there was a situation, and I say this as a pregnant woman right now, if there was some situation that arose where my life was in danger and the only way of saving my life was to directly and intentionally end the life of my child, would I choose that path? No, I wouldn't. I would give up my life. I would rather die and live a shorter life than live a longer life riddled with guilt because I'm essentially alive at the expense of, of harming my own child. And I share a powerful story in my book of uh, a woman back from where I'm originally from in Canada, my, my, my former diocese, uh, when she had a two-year-old boy, got pregnant again, happily married, uh, her doctor discovered that she had very advanced metastatic cancer and told her, and she was about 16 weeks along, and told her that she needed to have an abortion and start immediate treatment for the cancer. And she said, I'm, I'm not going to do that. And he said, no, you don't understand. Like, we need to do immediate intervention on this cancer. Now, it can be ethical if it's life or death for you to receive cancer treatment, but just not do the abortion first. And it's possible that your chemotherapy or radiation or surgery even wouldn't harm the child. Uh, if it did harm the child, one would argue that according to the principle of double effect, you're not administering cancer treatment to harm the baby, you're administering it to kill the cancer. Um, so she could have received treatment if it was life or death in that moment. But what she said was, I want to wait until full term. I want to give this child the best chance of living, and then I welcome all and any aggressive interventions to try to kill this cancer. So she proceeded through with a pregnancy. Preg a birth came along around 40 weeks, mm -hmm. and she gave birth to her baby, and then they started cancer treatment. And um, she lived for two years, but ultimately succumbed to the cancer. And her husband um, gave me the just the most beautiful interview that that I write about. But I was so moved by his attitude and what he conveyed her attitude was, which was my life is to be a life of love and I'm to pick up my cross and follow Christ. And as Christ was willing to lay down his life for us, I'm willing to lay down my life for my child. And that's what Lorraine did. And, you know, like, I think the most important takeaway from her story is that she had the right attitude. And the attitude is, I am a pilgrim on a journey, and this earth is not my home. And my goal is heaven. So what? how do I have to live to get there? I, I embrace Christ. But who is Christ? He is a God who loved us so much that he laid down his life so that we might live. That's what Lorraine did. That's what all of us are called to do. And I think 
when you hear a story like that, you can't help but be moved by the beauty of such self-sacrificing love. It is so moving. And it's also the story of Chiara Corbella, who's another, uh, I think, on her way to canonization, Italian woman, a similar story about delaying cancer treatment because she was pregnant. And there's all of these, uh, you know, Gianna Mola, who is similar, Saint Gianna. Um, and it's just, you know, you hear these stories and, I, you know, I want to play devil's advocate for a moment on two fronts because this is, you know, the culture we're in, obviously, uh, struggling to see the truth here. And first of all, there is the uh, devil's advocate argument of, okay, well, you left behind, a, in the case of your friend Lorraine, you left behind a two-year-old. She died two years after that baby was born. And then I guess a four-year-old or other baby would have been four at that time with her passing. Uh, why didn't you just start the chemotherapy? Maybe your baby would have survived, you know, even despite the chemotherapy. Maybe you could have had a shot at living. Mm -hmm. Maybe. And that's why uh, if the cancer is serious enough, it would be ethical too. Mm -hmm. And I think her heroic decision to go even beyond was leaving behind for her children in the absence of her physical life, a legacy of what the purpose of their lives was for. Wow. And both uh, Aaron and Michael, her children, um, love the Lord, um, have married, have beautiful marriages, wow. are parents too. I think they each have four children. Um, one of them is a Catholic missionary. Amazing. And so, and he has, he has said that he believes even like his, his own, um, experiences throughout his life is he was almost spared from a lot of difficulties because he believes the intercessory prayer of his mother. Who wow. Was, you know, That's praying, beautiful. Praying for him from heaven. So, Again, these are, these are, they're not tangible. They're not physical. We live in a world that wants everything to just work out as happily ever after. And the reason why I actually think Lorraine's story is so important is from the worldly perspective, it's not a happily ever after, right? You do leave a man as a widow and raising two children without their mother. That's, that's heartbreaking, but it's, the world we're living in is a heartbreaking world because we're in an imperfect world. It's not the world we're meant, we were meant to be in when sin entered it. It became fractured and broken. And so that's why God's got this other world waiting for us where the, the book of Revelation tells us there will be no more tears. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm just, I, I, in my own experience, even of loss, you know, of, of losing four babies, I had to come to terms with the fact that this world is not the end result because, you know, as we said at the beginning, I have this beautiful marriage with this most amazing man that you set me up with. And, and there have been moments that are so idyllic that you can sometimes forget, wait, this isn't, this isn't the goal. Heaven's the goal. And, and so losing four children to miscarriage, I struggled with at times thinking, what was the point of those pregnancies? especially the last one where I went through a, a very challenging first trimester and was very sick and, and then the baby died. So then it was like, well, what was the point of that? What was the point of the sickness? What was the point of laying on the couch and not playing with my two-year-old as much? Oh, she wasn't quite two yet. Um, you know, because the baby just died. And then I, and as a result of asking that question, I had to realize, oh my gosh, <laughs> the value of my children is not in the length of their life. The value of my children is not in how much time I get with them. It is that they are made in God's image, that they were willed into existence by a loving God who wants to spend eternity with them. And oh my goodness, I can celebrate the fact that my children have achieved the goal, that they are in heaven, and that I now have four intercessors praying that, that I achieve that goal too through the cross of Jesus Christ, the blood being shed. And so... Um, my own journey of having to realize, don't get too comfortable here. Heaven is the goal is something I think stories like Lorraine's also help us wrestle with as well, that there are inconveniences to this world. There are sicknesses that don't get solved. There are cancers that don't get cured. Um, but do we have a right ordered perspective for why we're here which is to know, love, and serve God in this world and to be happy with him in the next, and then to make sure we we get where we're supposed to go. So beautiful stuff. I, the other part of it is for someone who 
is not a Christian. You know, they don't <clears throat> they don't believe in heaven. Uh, and this is, you know, back to public policy for a minute. This is why a Christian or a non-Christian can together agree that, yes, public policy, even in the case of a risky pregnancy or challenges during pregnancy, you choose ethical options, but abortion, intentionally killing the baby, should never be permitted. It's never a medical treatment. Why is that the case, even if the person themselves is not a believer? They don't believe in a heaven. Yeah, it's still the case because all humans are equal. And um, I think one of the best examples I can give is one I give in the book of when I debated a late-term abortionist uh, several years ago. And during cross-examination, I asked him a question that seemed disconnected from abortion, but was actually entirely connected. And I cited for him a news story where there were reports that in China, practitioners of Falun Gong, which is a spirituality some people over there practice, uh, were being arrested and their organs harvested, illicitly taken from these people, and then transplanted into someone who needed a heart or a kidney or whatever. And of course, these people were left to, you know, to die or died right away or, or whatever. And um, I said to the abortionist, would you agree that the removal of a Falun Gong practitioner's organs uh, was a medical act and required medical expertise, as well as the transplantation into someone else's body? And he, he agreed, as anyone reasonable would, that yes, those are medical acts done by medical people. Um, and I said, would you agree that although it's a medical act done by a medical person, that it was an unethical act? And he agreed. And the point then was to get him to, to admit that some acts can be done and we can put a medical, you know, fingerprints all over it, but it doesn't mean it should be done, even if it can be done. And the reason it should not be done is because the other party was an innocent human person. So in the same way, when a woman's life is in danger, uh, the path that is not open to us is the path of abortion, even if it's done by a medical doctor, even if it's done in quote unquote sanitary conditions, because what is being done to try to help someone else, just like the person who needed a transplanted organ, what is being done if it's an abortion is the direct killing of an innocent human person's life to try to benefit someone else. And if it's wrong in the case of the practitioner of Falun Gong, I would say it's also wrong in the case of the preborn child and abortion. Awesome. Yeah, very well said, Steph. Okay, I want to do one more of these um, because it's one that people get frequently. And it was used in some of these state battles like in Ohio and other places as a reason for making abortion legal. And that's the cases of rape or incest. You know, these heartbreaking cases, usually there's an 11 or 12 year old girl who's made the, uh, you know, the basically mascot for the pro-abortion side of why you need to enshrine abortion on demand. What's the pro-life response to that? So when people bring that up, we need to have profound compassion and sympathy for victims of sexual assault and acknowledge that what has happened to them is a terrible evil that we need to respond to with justice. The guilty party where justice needs to be done is with the rapist. Any child that is conceived is an innocent party, much like the rape victim herself. We could ask the question, is it fair to give the death penalty to the innocent child? A consequence we don't even give to the rapist for the act of rape. Uh, I think another angle that we can come from is to share the stories of people who have been down that path and experienced that brutality and have nonetheless chosen life. And I know that, that you've mm -hmm. recently interviewed a, a friend of mine, Leanna Rebolito, mm -hmm. whose story is just mind blowing of how she was raped and became pregnant at the age of 12 and nonetheless carried through with that pregnancy. And doctors offered her an abortion. And remarkably, at that very tender age, she had the wherewithal to ask, if I have an abortion, will it take away all my feelings that no matter how many times I shower, I'm dirty? Will it take away mm -hmm. my memories and all of these experiences that are making it hard to sleep at night? And when the doctor had to admit that technically an abortion wouldn't do that, she said in her, one of her interviews, then I just didn't see the point. She said, all I knew was that I had a life inside of me that needed me mm -hmm. and I needed her. And she carried through with that pregnancy. And what's I think especially powerful about it is that she talks about how, and other rape victims might have the same experience, how she became suicidal and was tempted to kill herself. And she told me when I first met her that she decided that she wouldn't kill herself 
precisely because she was pregnant and she knew if she ended her life, it would end the baby's life. So it was the very existence of the child conceived in rape that saved her own life from a self-destructive act. And so um, I can say abortion is wrong in cases of rape, but someone like Liana Rebolito, who's lived through that trauma, saying it's wrong and this is how choosing life looked for me and how grateful I was for my daughter and um, that has a lot of power to it. You know, to also have the example of people like a, your friend and mine, Ryan Bomberger, a pro-life speaker who was conceived in rape and his mom, who was the rape victim, uh, placed Ryan for adoption. She did not feel that she could raise him and that's okay. She waited until, as we talked earlier, there was the safety net of someone who could care for him. And once she gave birth, found an adoptive family and and then he was raised in a beautiful family that had adopted I think like 10 other children <laughs> um so Ryan is grateful for his life he's grateful for the example of his birth mom and he has paid it forward by adopting children of his own so these are the stories that we want to put forward when the news media puts forward other stories saying abortion is needed in cases of rape the reality is when that terrible evil occurs and if a rape victim gets pregnant at that point, the baby has to come out of that woman's body or that girl's body, dead or alive. The baby has to come out. But if our option is dead or alive, then what's the most ethical um, ethical approach? The dead approach, which would be inflicting death, or the alive approach? And um, I, I think whenever we choose life, although there's challenges, and we talked about this at the beginning, it's there's hard times in choosing life and in parenting but life always wins and is the most fulfilling and rewarding choice. As you say, life, uh, love unleashes life. And love is that, that extra force that changes everything. The willingness to choose the good for the other, even when it's difficult. And yes, of course, laws should ensure that we can't choose ill for each other in certain cases, um, like abortion or any sort of destructive act against a neighbor but or another person. But at the end of the day, what you're working towards, what we want to build is that culture of love. And it starts with us individually, you know, and how we do everything that we're trying to do and all of our all of our imperfections. Um, OK, everyone listening, please get Stephanie's book. Stephanie, where can people find your book? It's also going to be linked in the bio of this um, or linked in the description of the, of the episode. Yes. So uh, once again, the book is My Body for You. And uh, by going, the best way to go is stpaulcenter.com slash my body for you. And in fact, any of your listeners that go there can put in the coupon code Lila15 and then they will get a special discount. Oh, nice. So stpaulcenter.com <laughs> slash my body for you. And uh, yeah, I just pray it's a blessing to people. It is a blessing. You are a blessing. You are the best. Thank you for still making the time for writing and speaking and podcasting in the midst of all the busyness of motherhood. And I, I want to end with that because, you know, to kind of close out the conversation we started here about uh, just changes in our lives. You're sharing about changes in yours post motherhood and how it does change us. But, um, you know, there's a raging debate right now. We just did an episode called Being There or On Being There, uh, Motherhood in the First Three Years with Erica Commissar. I know you and I have texted about this already, yeah. but maybe just a last word for especially moms listening or women listening who, <clears throat> you know, are engaged in really meaningful work that they love and they feel like, okay, I do feel called to motherhood or they are mothers and they still feel called to the meaningful work. And I believe it is possible to do both, just not, um, you know, you can't be the same intensity level before kids that you are after kids. Things have to change to put the child first. But what are any kind of final thoughts you have on that? Yeah, for sure. Well, first of all, to listen to that episode, because as I texted you, I'd been listening to uh, Erica mm -hmm. Commissar for about a month or two before hearing you interview her. And your interview was one of my favorites of all the ones I've listened to. So to to really take it to heart um, that this woman has a lived experience, she has a, a study experience, is her professional job as a, as a psychotherapist, um, um, so that there is um, merit to the idea, actually, which I quote in, at the start of my book, to the, the old poem. It's like over two, 100 or 200 years old, but the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. And if we have brought the life into the cradle, then we ought to be the hand forming and influencing that child, as I said earlier, as Mary influenced Jesus and made him for mission. 
Um, obviously, God made Jesus and God was Jesus for the mission of love, but he entrusted Mary as his mother to form him and nurture him and to be in a relationship of attachment and communion with him um, as preparation for when he would go out to the world. And we as mothers of, of our children have the great joy to be able to do that as well. And there are still things we can do outside of the, the daily role of motherhood. And my own experience of motherhood has made me think of, oh, now I understand why there was like Mary Kay makeup and um, <laughs> uh, Tupperware parties and <laughs> different things where women Now just we added... understand MLM, Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but we're that's, the, uh, that's what I love about writing and podcasting. And I'm, I'm so grateful for my work at live action because of the flexibility, but it's like, you know, after I know what we're both going to do after we wrap in a second here, your nap time's almost up for you. I'm going to run, run home to my kid, my kiddos. And, you know, but that flexibility for many women, it is possible. They can make it work. Sometimes it's not possible. There are jobs that are much harder for women to do and be the present mother that they are called to be. And, you know, I think that's where I just feel very, you know, a humility and a gratitude that we have these opportunities to write and podcast and do the things that we're doing uh, in a way that can still make that primary space for our our littles it's not it's not everybody's path i know so i just want to call that out and i try i tried to say in the episode with erica because there were some people like you work hypocrite and it's like well there's different kinds of work and right. you know i think that there is nuance here <clears throat> and i know that we've talked about this a lot on, on and offline but i think the core message you're given which is so beautiful is that the work of motherhood which is work you know which is supreme dignity uh is work that is world changing it is world changing, not only for us, which helps us grow as as human beings, but for the very children, you know, that we're mothering. And I think the key is that any choice we make, I married an economist, and so I have <laughs> learned from him, everything comes with costs. <laughs> There's always costs. And so we have to decide what we want the cost to be. And, you know, uh, Matthew Kelly, the speaker and author, once said, the only way to say no to anything is to have a deeper yes. Mm -hmm. So are, are both of us very lucky to have the, the type of outlet that we have, you know, our version of Mary Kay makeup or or Tupperware parties is, is we can podcast and write and, and speak um, around a very flexible schedule. And those other programs also are generally very flexible schedules. Um, but we have had to say no to things. I used to travel all the time. I am Same. frequently like fifty percent no. of the time. Yeah, the travel yeah. used to be. Mm -hmm. I like never travel anymore. <laughs> and when I do, then I set parameters up. Like my whole family has to come with me. Um, so, mm -hmm. so there, there is a lot of no's, uh, but a, a deeper yes. Mm -hmm. And so, for anyone struggling with. Well, that isn't my reality. Should it be my reality? Can it be my reality? Is to enter into prayer and ask yourself, what do you want your deeper yes to be? Mm -hmm. And what do you have to do to make that deeper yes come to fruition? And to be okay with no's being part of the deeper yes. And realize not only to be okay with it, but again, as my economist husband would say, that's a normal part of life. There's always no's when we make yeses. There's always I love that. I love that. Sis, you're the best. You're the Let's best. do this Thanks again. Write another on. book. <laughs> and see, we would have been together. We would have been together, uh, but because we're both pregnant. <laughs> I know. We better not, do this together okay. thing soon, though. I miss you. It's been too long. It has been. Come to California. <laughs> <laughs> come to Florida. <laughs> we shall see. We'll see. I mean, I guess after the babies come, when can be the next soonest time? We'll, we're going to have to get this on the books because otherwise yes. life is going to go by. So we got to make it happen. Very true. Thanks so much for coming on. Thank you. Love you. Miss you. Love you too. Thanks so much for listening to this episode with Stephanie Gray Connors. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, do not forget to subscribe to the podcast if you are listening on Apple or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. And if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe and hit that notification bell so that you never miss an episode of the podcast. Also, we have a Locals community now. I'm really excited about this. Locals is where it's at. It's an independent free speech platform where you can support your favorite content creators. I hope that you will join the Lila Rose page on Locals. The link is in the bio. You can become a subscriber. I think it's $9.99 or $10 a month, and then you'll get special access behind the scenes, and you will help fuel this podcast so we can keep making episodes. So go check that out at Locals.com and the link in the bio. 
to be part of that growing community. Thanks so much, guys. And we'll see you next time.